Uh, thank you for uh, having me here this morning. Uh, the way I'm going to present this is through a chronological narrative, but also with asides as I go. As a military historian, I'm often going to revolve this story around war and conflict to show how that political dynamic is changing and interfering with the church's mission. Uh, just follow along up here, but you'll notice that I'm going to stick to the narrative regardless of exactly what is on the screen at the time. So one of my favorite quotes I like to start with is uh, this quote from the Bible, which is, What king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Probably my favorite uh, military strategic quote. Anyone? Jesus Christ, yeah. Yeah. the greatest strategist of all time. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we forget that Jesus isn't just Lord, he's king, and we, we tend to forget what it means to be a king. The king is supposed to be out there leading his people, and Jesus Christ directs us on how we should engage on the battlefield uh, for souls that we're on. And when we deal with the issue of race, especially in North America, we are on, in a battlefield. It's a spiritual battlefield, it's a minefield, and in order for us to be victorious, which ultimately Jesus Christ will be anyway, but for us in our walks to be victorious, we should have an idea of the lay of the land, of the terrain on which we're fighting. And that is why I want to deal with this history of race. Now, I tend to treat race as a heresy because I want to think of it as something like Arianism, something that eventually the church will be triumphant over and it will cease to be a major issue because the church ultimately defeated it. We had people like Athanasius, uh, who basically was against the whole world at one point. But ultimately, Orthodox Christianity went out and went on to transform the world. So by God's grace, we can continue to do that in the future to God's glory. Now, when we talk about race, race as itself as a concept is only about 600 years old. It's relatively new. The Romans, the Greeks had no concept of blood purity as it was. It didn't exist back then. So if we recognize it as being something that's a relatively new innovation in human history, then it is something that can also go away. It's not permanent or natural. We just don't find it. We have evidence of Ethiopians, which is what Romans called anyone who was black and not from Egypt at that time period, uh, serving in the Roman army, fighting the Romans, trading in Rome. That's just, there's no concept of that kind of identity stopping people. Now, people understood differences, understood language and religion and nationality, but this idea of blood doesn't really come into being until you get to the Reconquista in Spain. After hundreds of years of warfare between the Christians and the Muslims to eventually defeat and liberate Iberia from Islamic rule, you have a change in the Iberian church and the Iberians themselves. The Spanish are becoming more hardened. I mean, if you think about it, an 800 year long conflict to liberate yourself from religious uh, wars when you were invaded in the middle of the 8th century tends to take a toll on your society. And one of the things that begins to happen to the Spanish is that they begin to become suspicious of anyone who is not Catholic. And at first it's directed against the Jews. We have as early as 1449, it's really the earliest we can really pinpoint this, the development of a purity of the blood doctrine. That Jews who had converted to Catholicism were not necessarily truly Catholic, truly Christian, or truly Spanish because their blood was not pure. Now this is a great innovation, and at first the church, the Roman Catholic Church, to its credit, opposes this doctrine because it quite obviously cuts against the authority of the Pope himself as head of the church to determine who is and who is not inside the church. If you can determine that on the basis of blood descent, then you're actually undermining the authority of the church. And the church was very wise to this from the beginning to see how this could be a problem. But it's going to continue to creep into this narrative until we get to the development of the conflict between the Europeans and indigenous peoples in the Americas. Now, when we talk about race in America, we often talk about in terms of slavery, but you have to understand that there's a couple of things. Slavery had begun to disappear from Europe at this point. The Roman Catholic Church had worked very, very hard and been very successful at demonstrating that Christians should not enslave other Christians. So you have the disappearance of slavery from Europe itself and slavery reverts to the way it was during the Romans and the Greeks. It was mostly a consequence of uh, losing wars. If you think of Alexander's enslavement of the people of Tyre, they resisted, they were enslaved. Uh, the Romans and the Carthaginians, the Romans and people in Spain, slavery was more or less linked to defeat and war. You defeat your enemies, and one of the ways of dealing with them permanently is to disarm them, enslave them, occupy their territories. So in the concept of war against unbelievers, you still have the idea of enslavement being used as a punishment tool of war, because that's what war is like. But it's 
it's kind of limited by the idea of just war. You have to be justified in going to war in the first place. And the church is generally more in line with making this happen than not. So there's generally success in this, which is why slavery is disappearing from Europe. However, when we get to the Atlantic discoveries and we get to the ministry of people like Bartolomeu Lacasas, who was the, uh, uh, the, basically the protector of the Indians in Spanish America, we have the introduction of a, a new problem, the idea that these new peoples who are different from us, from the Europeans, are somehow inferior and therefore don't necessarily need to receive the gospel and therefore they're fair game. They're not exactly created the same as, it, as God created the European church. And this begins very, very slowly to creep in after the end of the Reconquista, which is also in 1492 with the fall of Granada, same year that Columbus it just, you know, discovers India, or as I like to say, when Columbus got lost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but as this is happening, you're discovering new riches, new resources, and eventually a desire for labor forces to reap these rewards. So when you have La Casas, La Casas is actually, his father's gonna go on the voyages with Columbus. His father will then come back, pick up his son, bring him over. La Casas then come back to Spain to be trained in law and ministry. La Casas goes back to the islands where he begins to participate in the abuse and enslavement of the Amerindians. It is during this period that he's gonna to begin to have a change of heart, to be confronted in his conscience by the hypocrisy he saw. You see, what the Roman Catholic Church had done was to say, you can defend yourself from attack from the natives, but you're not supposed to go there to conquer. Instead, you have to offer them Jesus Christ. Well, the Spanish came up with a very interesting way of getting around this. They would stand just out of arrow range uh, from the natives. They would then offer them Jesus Christ in Spanish. <laughs> when the indigenous peoples did not receive Christ and take up positions against them, then the Spanish would claim self-defense and attack and then say, okay, now we can defeat them. We've done what the church told us to do, but we were attacked and therefore we had to defend ourselves. And Lacoste actually writes about witnessing this kind of blatant hypocrisy and disregarding of what the church has said, because it's not about spreading the gospel. It's about trying to find loopholes by which you can be acquisitive to acquire gain. It's greed and avarice. And as this begins to affect him, he experiences a conversion. Uh, and this is his words. He experiences two conversions. One conversion where he realizes this is wrong, and another conversion after his initial efforts to alleviate the situation fail, where he goes back to Spain to be further trained and then to come back as a missionary bishop. Now, one of the problems he encounters is going to be from the state and from people who are gaining a lot of wealth. So this is the introduction of a, a church and state conflict where the problem isn't that the church is trying to control the state, but rather that the state wants to claim to be acting with the legitimacy of Christianity, but doesn't want to follow the moral dictates of the Christian faith, which, you know, as a Protestant myself, I think we sometimes get that part of Reformation story wrong, that generally the problem isn't with the church running the state, it's generally the other way around. And I, I think that we need to be aware of that, that in this situation, that's exactly what the problem is. Because what happens is, Lacasse starts looking for loopholes. He starts looking for ways to try to get the Spanish to stop abusing the Amerindians. At one point, he even says and suggests, you know, wouldn't it be better to enslave the Africans instead? They might be better suited to this kind of work instead of the indigenous peoples who are dying in such huge numbers. He later realizes that that's uh, not exactly the right way to solve the problem and has to repent of that himself. And I think it's also a lesson that sometimes when we're in tough situations, we shouldn't try to go for the easy solution. We should actually stick to the work of the gospel and it will probably keep us out of trouble, as Lacasas himself found. But he ends up in what becomes the great, uh, the first great moral debates of Europe, held in a university in Spain in 1550 to 1551, where they began to argue about the treatment of the indigenous people. So now we're about 60 years into the age of discovery, we have this period where you're now having a great moral debate and Lacassus is arguing that you cannot use, under any circumstances, you cannot use uh, this idea of racial superiority as logical or scriptural. He uses Aristotle to refute it. He uses the Roman invasion of Spain itself and the resistance of the ancient Iberians to the Romans to refute it. And then, of course, Holy Scripture. By all accounts, he wins the debate, but it's irrelevant. Uh, Charles V. Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain has no interest in actually altering course because the wealth of the 
South, well, basically Latin, what we now call Latin America, that wealth is going to make Spain the greatest power in Europe. For 100 years, Spanish infantry are going to dominate European battlefields backed up by Amerindian silver. And that silver is going to allow Spain to expand into India, into South Asian markets, becoming the European power that kicks off globalization. And so adhering to Christian doctrine would mean basically weakening the king's coffers, and the king has no intention of doing that. And he's got a lot of influence over the church. And one of the things this tells about Lacasas is that even though he has all this against him, he learns to maintain his convictions. Uh, he recognizes his mistakes, the mistakes of his past, and forges ahead with a new ministry. He doesn't allow those things to bind him down. And of course, again, he learns you can't take the easy way out, that ultimately service for Jesus Christ is sacrificial. As one of my professors at my undergrads at Oral Roberts University, uh, Paul Vickery writes in his book on Lacassus, he writes that Lacassus was more than a cleric, a political activist, or simple chronicler of the events transpiring in the New World. However, Lacassus assumed the role of being the very conscience of Catholic Spain, a nation that grappled not only with the spiritual mandate to save souls, but also with the human desire to acquire wealth. Well, that's actually what, what you are, or at least for Anglicans like me that the idea that we look to our bishops and to our priests to basically help us to sear our consciences, to basically speak into us. And hopefully this will help you in doing that. I know that I have benefited greatly from my bishop, John Guernsey, and I know that Anglicans across North America and the world will continue to look to their bishops for this kind of guidance. And I think it's the guidance that Lacoste has provided, that he provided an example and a language that we can use to deal with these issues. Furthermore, as the Pope begins to wrestle with this time period, he's dealing with both the Reformation. The Reformation actually strengthens Spain against the papacy because the Pope now needs powerful Catholic kings to deal with the Protestants, which means that it actually gives Charles V more influence to interfere with the church rather than the other way around. Right? It's kind of ironic how that works. At the same time, Pope Paul III actually passes an interesting papal bull called Sublimus Dei. And it actually reads that the enemy of the human race, which of course is Satan, who opposes all good deeds in order to bring men to destruction, beholding and envying this, invented a means never before heard of by which he might hinder the preaching of God's word of salvation to the people. He inspired his satellites who, to please him, have not hesitated to publish abroad that the Indians of the West and the South and other people of whom we have recent knowledge should be treated as dumb brutes created for our service, pretending that they are incapable of receiving the Catholic faith. And he then goes on to mandate excommunication against anyone engaged in the slave trade. So then the question then comes to what happened? The emperor forced him to withdraw it. Interesting. So right here, in 1537, Pope Paul III has identified our enemy. He looks and says, this is the work of Satan. And Satan is attempting to prohibit us, to prevent us, to stop us from spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's how we should think about uh, racism and this entire doctrine, that it is simply a tool of the enemy designed to divide and to defeat Christ's church. And that's why we should react to it as we do to Arianism or any other heresy that keeps people from Jesus Christ. And we had a pope at that time giving us the language with which we should attack and assail this doctrine, but it's because the interference of the government and financial interests that actually caused the papacy to withdraw this. And we've all, Catholics, Protestants, all Christians, been paying the penalty for about 500 years. So if we get to our own history as Anglicans in English America, uh, what I'd like to do is talk briefly about our relationship with the Native Americans. It's complicated in terms of race because it's forged in warfare. On some occasions, Amerindians might be treated as allies against other Amerindians. In other cases, people might want to claim descent from famous Amerindians such as Pocahontas. In other cases, Amerindians are just treated as enemies to be defeated. It goes back and forth and it's because of the, the vagaries of war, the idea that you, it's complicated and it's situational. And it takes time before it develops into a full-on doctrine of we just get rid of them. In the early periods, there was intermarriage between the settlers, the colonists, and the native peoples, other times it was just out and out warfare. It goes back and forth. But also because you end up with a situation where you don't want to be known for being victorious over people who are just inferior to you. 
So oftentimes the Amerindian peoples who are defeated in battle by the colonists would be built up into uh, mythic figures of, of great valiant warriors who are defeated so that the conquest might seem to be honorable victories. But if they're inferior, how can it be honorable victories to be victorious over people who are already inferior to you? So again, it becomes very, very complicated because of the various narratives that people want to tell themselves. Eventually, over about 200 years really, it simply becomes a get rid of them, take the land, etc. And that's mostly in the early 1800s. And then of course you move towards the Trail of Tears and Jackson after that period as well. But during the early period from basically 1607 up to the War of Independence, there's this nebulous back and forth relationship between incorporation, assimilation, coming together, fighting, uh, denigrating, and lifting up. It's often racialized, but it's not codified yet. And what race begins to do once you have the introduction of Africans into Virginia in 1619 is to destroy the idea of nationality and community. Because prior to race, people would have identified on the basis of their location, you're in England, your constitution, you're under the monarchy and parliament, your language, you speak English or Welsh, or you're a Cornishman, your religion, you're Anglican, the Church of England, and therefore you'd say you were Christian subjects of the English crown. That's your identity. The idea of race would not have entered into it because there were no laws based on race at that time in England. If you've got to think about it, why would King Henry II, who gave us the common law, have been thinking of race in the 12th century? I mean, he's, he's leading the Angevin Empire. He's got other things on his mind. So you have to actually create these laws to actually create racism during this period. And it kind of looks like this. If you follow along the timeline, we have 1607, the establishment of the colony and dominion of Virginia. 1619, the first Africans arrive in British America. But it's not until 1662 that you have free and slave status being defined at birth depending on the mother status. So you have that long period before that was actually the case because slavery didn't exist under English common law. So in the colonies and for the colonies, you have to actually create laws affirmatively establishing slavery. Then in 64, you have slavery enforced for life. Then in 1676, 100 years before the War of Independence, you have Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, where you had an alliance of the poor and lower income blacks and whites of the colony of Virginia fighting together against the elite. And they actually managed to take and sack Jamestown. Later, later defeated and put down as rebels, but the realization that the blacks and whites of the colony were actually uniting together against their betters uh, makes people come with an idea that it best not let that happen again. So a couple of solutions to this uh, supposed problem was that you would create a racial caste system assigning to the whites the higher status and to the blacks the inferior status permanently, therefore dividing them, which is something that's actually worked pretty well for about 350 years. So give them credit for thinking that one out. Uh, and military historian humor. <laughs> and then of course the idea that you would stop bringing in more white indentured servants and rely more on slave labor so that when you get into the period of the 18th century, we often think of America as an immigrant nation, but that's actually false. The idea of America as an immigrant nation isn't really a true story until you get to the late 19th century. If you're dealing with the 18th century, from about, 1700, about 1701 to 1800, you have five times as many enslaved Africans coming to British North America as you have Europeans. You have only about 50, 60,000 Europeans coming over you have over 200,000 Africans being brought over as slaves during this period. So the number of slaves is actually outstripping the number of immigrants. American birth rate is really what's supplying the population growth during that period. It's actually just the birth rate of the colonial subjects. When you get to 1680, now all black persons in Virginia will be disarmed and forced to carry traveling papers. So that wasn't the case before then. In 1691, interracial marriage is now banned. So you have this period where it wasn't banned because it didn't exist in English law, so you, how could you ban it? Now you have it where it is banned. So often is where I, I push against the idea of, of constant progress. History doesn't always go in one direction, it goes like this. Because you had a period before this was a law, and then we had this long period where it was the law. By 1705, the law, and of course, this is under the Church of England being the official church of the colony and the empire, the law now permits the dismemberment of an unruly slave. That's uh, very, probably not Christian. And then 17, I assume. And then 1715, 
free Negroes and Amerindians are now disenfranchised. So in theory, they could have been enfranchised prior to this law based, of course, on property qualifications. After this, they are no longer enfranchised, and of course, interracial couples are now exiled from the colonies. So you've had the creation of a, a new doctrine, a new legal system where it did not previously exist. And if you look at the map, you see how the economy of the world is already globalized. The idea of globalization is hundreds of years old. You have the trade coming from India, from Africa, linking to Europe and North and South America. So you have this wide-ranging uh, slave trade that is fueling the economy of the British Empire, which then allows the empire to participate in the trading economies and the trading scales of Asia. The idea is to get access to the markets of Asia, and the Europeans are competing with one another over them. The Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, and the British, and the Dutch are using slave labor to raise their crops and their goods in the Americas and then fund their activities in Asia. This is to give you an idea of the numbers. This is in the 18th century, uh, the numbers of slaves being brought over. Interestingly, a huge number go just to Brazil, even though people largely think of it as an American problem. There's a, a real lack of knowledge of how big of an issue it was in Brazil and how most of the slaves overall are going to the European colonies in the Caribbean because that's where you can get rich quick, especially through sugar. And of course, British North America, which is basically the United States, Around 250,000 end up in the United States. A few end up in Canada, Bermuda, and other places. But most of that number of 275,000 is what becomes the United States, basically from Maine and, or Massachusetts uh, down to Georgia. Now, during the Great Awakening, probably don't need to give this bunch too much of a lecture on that. But it's the beginning of abolitionism, which is going to introduce some interesting contradictions as people begin to talk about literacy, Ending, ending enslavement, witnessing to the enslaved. This becomes very controversial for Anglicans. There's an interesting book written about this called Anti-Blackness in English Religion, 1500 to 1800, where it deals with some of the problems the Anglican priests get into in Virginia as they want to witness and preach the gospel to the enslaved, but the slave owners know that you're not really supposed to enslave Christians, and so they don't want them to preach to the enslaved. And so then you have Anglican priests trying to argue that it's okay to enslave Christians Christians in order to gain entree onto the plantations so then they could try to spread the gospel. So it's this weird dance they end up doing and you have uh, historians <laughs> looking back at this saying this is very very odd uh, that you have again people trying to take the easy way out of the situation and compromising in order to try to further the gospel but then realizing that you really can't take shortcuts to the gospel it almost always backfires. Anglicans during the British War of, uh, or American War of Independence, or what I like to call the War of the Civil War of the British Empire, they're going to be divided, what we call the 80-20 split. Around 80% of Northern Anglican priests will be uh, pro-monarchy, 80% of Anglican priests in the South will be pro-patriot. And that is going to lead to some difficulties uh, for Anglicans and Episcopalians after the War of Independence with the southern church being a lot stronger than the northern church, but that's mostly because of the political dynamic that you had many in the north who were made loyal to the king. At that same time period, you're still having these arguments about whether or not slavery is okay. So you're going to have northern states, now states, no longer colonies, beginning to move away from it, southern ones uh, becoming more entrenched, and arguments over the curse of Ham. Rather than go too far into this, it's just needless to say this is an example of how the Bible begins to develop a legacy of being used to justify racism and enslavement in very, very odd ways. Uh, we also think about the idea of can we have servants or permanent slaves, as in Leviticus 25, and the acquisition of slaves, that appears to be permitted. Well, see, there's a problem with that. The biggest problem is this. The Bible doesn't actually justify American slavery. And people say, well, how can you say that? Because one of those tricky things about Paul being always logical, as my, as my father used to always tell me, the thing about Paul is that he's always logical. So Paul is problematic if you want to try to develop loopholes. He doesn't really give you any. Is that you can't pick and choose which parts of the law you want. You have to kind of follow the whole thing if that's actually how you're going to try to justify yourself. And American slavery as it's practiced doesn't actually line up with slavery as practiced in the Old Testament. And since you can't pick apart God's law, you have to take the whole thing or you don't, you can't then logically claim that the scripture justifies American slavery because people want to talk about slavery in the abstract. They don't want to discuss it in the particulars and the specifics. How did the enslaved get to the, Amer to get to the United States or to British America? 
Well, they were kidnapped, they were stolen. This was not a voluntary system. Well, as such, it is banned according to scripture. That actually, quite clearly, he who still is the man and sells him, and anyone who is found and possessed in him shall be put to death. So, you, people want to talk about slavery in the abstract, they don't want to talk about it in the specifics. They don't want to talk about the idea that after the Great Awakening, you have the conversion of the enslaved Africans to Christianity. Now, that 100-year-long process, by the time you get to the 1800s, you now have the overwhelming majority of enslaved Africans are now Christian. We've got a problem now. Because if they are Christians, can you maim, rape, sell, uh, abuse, murder, and steal from your Christian brethren? Is that authorized anywhere? Of course not. In fact, St. Paul is actually very clear where he actually says that humanity has come through one bloodline, that you know, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men, nor is it served by human hands and as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. So this whole idea that you've got these separate races that you can treat differently goes against scripture. Uh, he also is ordering here in his letter to Philemon, he says, accordingly though I am bold enough in Christ to command you, meaning he could issue a spiritual order or injunction. He says, to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. That's very interesting wording where he's saying, I could order you as a spiritual father to do this, but I am choosing not to use my authority. It doesn't mean he can't. So if he has the authority to order and to command, but he is choosing not to, that means that there is spiritual authority for condemning this. And if you are now to treat Onesimus as a brother, can you do the actions I previously mentioned to your brethren? You can't. In fact, when you do them, if you are saying that you are doing this while also worshiping Christ, you are doing them to Christ. For that is exactly what he says, if you do these to the least of these, and the least of these in American society, as defined by American society, were the enslaved. So all the actions done to the enslaved by American Christians were themselves done to Jesus Christ. This also is going to hurt the American move west, because as the Americans move west on their conquest of the, of the continent, the move west is going to bring with it slavery. Slavery actually helps the Americans to defeat Mexico because it gives it a manpower advantage, it gives it a wealth advantage. You take slaves out of the war with Mexico, both in Texas uh, and under Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston, and in the war under President Polk, if you actually were to remove the slaves from the continent, the United States probably would not actually have conquered the West. So by bringing the slaves into the country, you do two things. You give the United States a lot of wealth, but you also create a labor surplus, allowing large numbers of young men, especially Southerners, to volunteer for the armed services and then to actually fight and to conquer the West, whereas if they did not have the enslaved, those young men would have themselves to have been the Southern labor force and therefore could not have supplied the manpower for the military conquest of the West. So it's interesting how all of that is linked together. I like to call this portion the Pharisees of Liberty because I want to be respectful of your time and get really to the conclusion of the great epic of the American Civil War. I like to hearken on the statement about King Cotton, the idea that nothing opposes, nothing can resist the power of Cotton. And I say this is true only because if Cotton is king, then Jesus Christ isn't. Right? If, if nothing can resist Cotton, then you're actually making a very poignant statement. I don't think they realize how ironic a statement that they were making. Because if cotton is your king, then obviously Jesus isn't. And that's where your motivation and that is where your heart is. Racism becomes a method of destroying the church in 1816, which is basically uh, 202 years ago. So we're right around the bicentennial. You have the development of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is actually the church my father and his family all grew up in. It's a church that's divided now on the basis of theology, which is what we almost kind of expect or recognize in the post-Reformation world, but one where people share a common language, they're English speaking, they're in North America, they're in the United States, they have the same Methodist doctrine of the Wesleys as adapted for America, but they disagree on one issue, racial equality. And so you have a church where now race is becoming a point of theological division as opposed to what we would normally consider the concerns of Christian theology.
where you can share the same theology, worship in the same language, be uh, members of the same country, but because of this perceived racial difference, the church divides. This is something that, this is the first time this happens and it's unheard of because normally splits would be on actual theological disagreement. In this case, it isn't. Theology has taken a backseat to racial prejudice. <clears throat> I define it as a heresy using the doctrines of Thomas Aquinas, historian, so I kind of like Thomas Aquinas in the medieval period. Uh, he says, what is heresy? He says, because he chooses not what Christ really taught, but the suggestions of his own mind. Therefore, heresy is a species of unbelief belonging to those who profess the Christian faith, but corrupt its dogmas. I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with the uh, book Cruelty of Heresy. I like this uh, quote from the introduction by uh, George Carey, former Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he said, heresy, however culturally attractive uh, they may be, actually debilitate the church's mission. And that's what we deal with now in modern America, because as we move towards the second and third Great Awakenings, this begins to create a legacy of problems that follows us into the 20th and 21st centuries. Debates over the family, debates over issues of personhood and identity, all have a subtext of the American history of race within them to attempt to undermine and delegitimize the Orthodox Christian position and the position of the church because of this bad history. And it's actually worked very, very effectively to promote the de-Christianization of many parts of the United States, both in academia, in the media, in the arts and the sciences, this kind of idea that the Christian worldview is delegitimized because of this history of race. And that's why I feel we have to confront it. It's during this period that you have Christians really taking a bold stand against slavery, especially in the North, but the opposite effect happening in the South. The more Northerners begin, Christians primarily, begin to push against enslavement and racial supremacy, the more you have others try to defend it. At the same time, we have a very controversial period for the North American church, the rejection of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce is successful in England, but in the United States, he's largely ignored. He doesn't win over the Episcopal church. He doesn't even succeed in winning over the Episcopal church in the North. He's still one of those guys over in England who's listening to the king, to the Hanoverians. The American church is much interested, so oftentimes we want to claim him as a hero, but the Episcopal Church actually doesn't take a strong stand against slavery during this period, at the same time that the Church of England is taking a strong stand, and you see the abolition of uh, enslavement in the British Empire, and the end of, the of enslavement for 700 to 800,000 uh, British slaves, primarily in the Caribbean. So we often get the idea, well, they didn't have as many as the Americans did, but actually the British had nearly a million slaves, so actually they had quite a few. And the church does take a strong stand there, and it is eventually defeated through the actions of Hannah Moore and especially people like William Wilberforce, which should be celebrated, but at the time was not really appreciated in the United States. We end up with this period and this idea of political reconciliation becoming the norm uh, for Episcopalians, for Anglicans in North America, the idea that we just want to gloss over differences and not really deal with them. And it's really a bad legacy of what happens after the Civil War, which is where I'm going to conclude. We have the uh, victory of politics over orthodoxy, if this sounds familiar to any of you. <laughs> James Hawley, first African-American uh, Episcopal bishop. Uh, he becomes missionary bishop to Haiti. He's born to uh, freed slaves in Washington, D.C., spends his life in the Episcopal Church trying to get to take a strong stand against slavery. It never actually does. He eventually ends up abandoning the United States for the missionary fields of Haiti, where he eventually dies. He'll be opposed at this time by the Bishop of Vermont, John Hopkins, who wrote in 1861, of all times to write something like this, a scriptural, ecclesiastical, and historical view of slavery, where he tries to defend slavery in the middle of the Civil War as being God's will. And you have a northern bishop doing this, and you can think of all the other northern bishops kind of looking and saying, really? This, this is not the time to do this. You know, there's kind of, there's kind of a problem. There, there is a joke about um, the different churches during the American Civil War about the sides they took, and they say, but if you ask an Episcopalian, they ask you, war, what war? <laughs> So you end up with uh, Alonzo Potter of um, Pennsylvania, who is the Bishop of Pennsylvania, in a theological battle with the Bishop of Vermont. During this time period, the presiding bishop was not elected. The presiding bishop was merely whoever was the senior bishop according to consecration, meaning that at the end of the Civil War, 
guess who becomes presiding bishop? The Bishop of Vermont. Right. The Bishop of Vermont, it's 1865. He just wants to make bygones be bygones. He doesn't want to deal with the legacy of Bishop Polk, the fighting bishop, the first bishop of Louisiana, a large slaveholder, friend of Jefferson Davis. I kind of like his story because you know, I get excited to talk about how he's actually killed in battle by General Sherman. And people are like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, he's literally killed in battle by General Sherman. Bishop Polk remains bishop, is a founding bishop of the Episcopal Church in the Confederate States of America, becomes a major general in the Confederate Army, being appointed by his friend Jefferson Davis, is fighting against Sherman's men in the outskirts of Atlanta. They've got the battlefield, they've got the trenches. He and a group of other Confederate generals actually poke their heads up to see what's going on on the outside. Sherman notices them, can tell that they're general officers, makes a remark about their arrogance and cockiness, and then goes to his artillery officer and, and asks him to open fire, actually killing Bishop Polk. So now we have this interesting and, and kind of, I guess, how do we want to, we're Anglicans, we don't really want to celebrate the death of one of our bishops, <laughs> especially in one of these, especially in this crowd. But then as a military historian, <laughs> But then as a military historian, it's kind of an interesting story of saying that Sherman actually killed another general directly because that's just kind of rare in the Civil War, right? So I always get kind of squeamish when I talk about this topic. I'm like, it's exciting, but I'm also Anglican, so I don't like it too much, right? <laughs> but the idea that this does become problematic because what do you do if you're the founding church of the nation? If you think of George Washington uh, being contrary to popular belief, not a deist, but an actual Christian, if you actually look at Washington's life, you know, actual historians. Um, it's the founding church of the nation now has divided itself on the issue of actually remaining in that nation, to have leading bishops in the South taking an affirmative role in the rebellion that because of a political change, they immediately changed the structure and organization of the church that are allowing politics to guide them, and then to actually sadly have one of them killed in battle by a victorious Union commander this becomes a struggle for the identity of the church and the legacy of the church in the aftermath of the Civil War. So the solution for the Bishop of Vermont is just going to be to pretend it didn't happen. In the name of politics, he actually ensures that there will be no condemnation of any of the bishops who uh, broke with the church. There will be no punishment for anyone who left the church to found the Episcopal Church and the Confederate States of America for committing treason, for fighting for uh, the South and for slavery and racial supremacy, that even the bishop consecrated during the war by the rebel bishops and bishops who were actually under arrest by the Reconstruction government because they were refusing to say prayers for the President of the United States after the war, which is something that you know, we pray for all our leaders, and refusing to pray for the United States government, so that actually you have, you have bishops and priests under arrest in the Episcopal Church by the Reconstruction governments, by the Union armies. The decision is just to bring them all back in in the name of reconciliation. But there will be no repentance, no condemnation. All that is swept aside. And so what you then have is because of this false peacemaking, because of this false reconciliation, this political definition of reconciliation and peacemaking, where it's about humans getting along rather than being reconciled to Jesus Christ, you bring these uh, individuals back into the church where they then stymie all the efforts of the church at real reconciliation for the next 80 years. So there are very, very serious consequences to choosing politics over orthodoxy, and this is Anglican Church in North America, so I don't think I have to preach too much of that to you. I think this is where I'd like to conclude by saying that this entire history has been one of showing the, the struggles that the church has with this ideology of how Christianity is, of course, the answer, but the answer is fidelity to Jesus Christ, uh, regardless of what that might actually cost us from other people. So, thank you. When you spoke at our synod, you concluded with a, a call to lament. Yes. Could you speak about that? Yes, Bishop John. Um, I've, I've given this talk a, a few times, if, uh, as Archbishop might remember, there was a um, kind of a discussion at Matthew 25 when people, uh, people who came on stage after me get their talk about race reconciliation, working with refugees, and the idea of repentance. And there was some pushback from people who said, well, why should I repent 
of things that I didn't personally do. And I really took that to heart and I actually spent some time thinking about it. Um, I don't know if you remember that, that uh, doing Matthew 25 Archbishop. And one of the things I thought about that Bishop John just brought up is we don't, especially in light of the sexual abuse scandals that have been rocking the United States, you don't have to be a perpetrator to lament with the victims. And I think that there is a biblical call for lamentation over uh, various misdeeds that have happened. That it doesn't imply that you're guilty of the misdeed, but it does imply that you're willing to, to weep, to cry, to commiserate, to come together with those who have been victimized. And that's why I was wondering if maybe an antidote to this um, uncomfortable feeling regarding repentance for things that people feel, you know, I've never been a racist, I've never done these things, so what's I repent of? I said, well, we can always lament as Christians, because as Christians, you know, as an African American, obviously I was not enslaving myself, um, but as a Christian, I find this is something to lament over and to be concerned about, because it hurts the spreading of the gospel, and it hurts bringing people to Jesus Christ, which is what should be our primary concern. And I think that that's something we should lament over, because that's, I mean, that is the concern. Right? The, con the concern is bringing souls to Christ. One of the, the things I said that I think that we forget about is we focus on enslavement as just about being the victimization of the Africans or the mistreatment of the Amerindians as just being a mistreatment of the Amerindians. But I think we forget that there's something very big picture here. If you are having churches that are endorsing this or looking the other way, what they are not doing is they are not calling the white population to repentance. And by not calling them to repentance, you're actually keeping them from a close relationship with Jesus Christ. So you're actually failing them too on a spiritual level. And I, I think that, I mean, and we think about the, the struggles with the church in North America today as a whole, and they say, oh, you don't like this group or you don't like that group. It's like, no, it's about calling people to Jesus Christ. And if you're not calling people to repentance, and if you're not calling them to Jesus Christ, then what are you doing? You know trying to make people comfortable? Well, that's not the church's job. And so I, I think that's something to lament, too, that you had generations of, of Americans, especially in the South and the North as well, who were people allowed them to keep hate in their hearts. It's one, when I talk to African-American groups, I tell them, you know you're not allowed to hold unforgiveness if you're a Christian, right? No, like, it's literally not allowed in Scripture, in black and white, by Jesus Christ. So there are people who say, oh, you know, I can't trust or forgive or, or think about this group. I was like, you're not allowed to do that. Jesus Christ said you can't. So whether you want to or not is actually irrelevant. <laughs> Jesus Christ has said that if you do not forgive them, then I will not forget. Yeah, yep. yeah they don't like that part. It's like, it's irrelevant. And that's where I think that's, it's a cause to lament because by allowing uh, hatred or dislike into the hearts of anyone who is, call, who is claiming to be a Christian and then the, the pastorate, the bishops, the church not calling them to repentance, uh, then you're not serving the flock. And I think that is something to lament because you had generations of Americans who were not called to repentance. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh,